name is Brian Eschenauer, and I work for Cornell's Integrated Pest Management Program. And I work on mostly now invasive species that are affecting agricultural crops. And so I talk about them, the implications, and their management. Um, but today I get to talk about native plants, which I really like. And so I'm excited to be here to do that uh, today. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, as we're going along, if you have any questions, I'm, I'll be happy to uh, take those. And uh, let's get started here. So with this picture, this is a little bit of a trick question, but, you know, you see this. I, I volunteer at a, uh, an old growth forest, and uh, one of the board members came to me and like, oh, look at this. What are we going to do about this? Um, there's holes in this uh, leaf. But you know what? This is actually what we want to see. We want to see a little bit of our native insects feeding on our native trees because it's how they uh, develop. And those insects that are feeding on those trees, taking a little <coughs> bit of the leaf matter, they then become food for the birds that are dependent on those insects. So um, this is one reason that native trees and native plants are beneficial in our landscape. They contribute to the ecosystem as a whole. Um, so they're uh, a part of that uh, food cycle. They're also generally well adapted to our local conditions. Um, they can survive drought a little bit better than many of our exotic plants that we bring into our gardens. They provide food and shelter for other wildlife to uh, woodpeckers and um, chipmunks and, and those things that are all a part of nature. And yeah, a lot of our native trees are the ones that are going to provide that nice fall color um, because they're in tune with our natural uh, change of seasons. Okay, so let's go back here. Um, another reason is we're finding that some of our native insects are on decline. And, you know, most of the insects that are out there are really beneficial for our ecosystem and we want to uh, you know, keep those insects healthy. And one of the ways we can do that is by including native plants in our landscape. And you know, I'm not a purist, I don't have 100% native plants. I have, in fact, I have some invasives on the state invasive <laughs> plant list in my garden that were planted before I got there and I'm not out there with a the chainsaw cutting those down. But I think whenever we can <laughs> incorporate some natives in, it can uh, benefit the environment. And we have uh, a horticulturalist uh, who is in charge of the Urban Horticulture Institute at Cornell, and she says appropriate plants uh, may be native to the local region or non-native, uh, so anything can be appropriate. Um, and a regionally native plant may be a poor choice if it doesn't match the site requirements. So just because it's native, maybe you have a dry, shady area, and this is a native fern, it might not do well there. So thinking of those things is important. And there's uh, some evidence to say that combining uh, natives with non-native plants can be beneficial to pollinators to extend that bloom season through the entire uh, growing season but we want to avoid the natives. Those non-native invasives are, is what we want to avoid. So um, you know those, you may have some of those in there, they may have been in your garden before you got there and um, the invasives, just like the invasive insects, the, the invasive plants can be an issue. And there are some regulations that came in um, in 2015 to help reduce the amount of invasive plants. And uh, they identified 69 plants in New York State. Each state has their own list, and this depends on the plants that are a concern in those areas. Uh, some of them that we may know include Norway maple, uh, burning bush, barberry, and honeysuckle. I think I still have, I have like three of those in my <laughs> yard still, slowly getting them out. This will not happen though, uh, <laughs> if you have them there. It is just to, uh, you know, 
reduce the number so these aren't available for sale. Or I think Norway Maple, the nursery industry, ought to keep that on the list. It just has to come with uh, a warning label that it could escape, the seeds could escape into the, the natural environment. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, I'm skeptical, like, oh, are these really a problem everywhere, or is it just more in urban areas? But we get concerned when they escape to forest situations and change the, the landscape there. And this was uh, in a, a wooded area, a forest uh, near Bristol, New York, and uh, there I can see a barberry that has escaped. So birds will feed on the fruit, from our landscape, and then when they're flying around, the, the seeds make it through the, their digestive system. New plants can get started. And there is some right there. In Bristol, there is a Norway maple and honeysuckle, all in this uh, one location. Even in a dense forest, there is a little bit of barberry getting started. And um, there is concern about that. Uh, this is, like I said, where it gets started from those seeds could uh, get transported around and new barberries get started. And one reason it can be a problem is when you have a thicket like this of uh, a lot of an invasive plant, particularly uh, barberry here, um, you can have more insects. It creates a habitat where there's a high humidity level and it allows ticks to really thrive. And in this case they found that um, a lot more ticks and ticks that can carry uh, Lyme disease in an area that has, uh, this was up in Connecticut, in an area that has uh, this barberry. So something to be aware of. And uh, in this experiment, they actually eliminated barberry and they found recovery. And part of this is also excluding deer because deer like to eat uh, a lot of our native plants, in including the uh, trillium there, but uh, when they uh, remove the barberry, the uh, tick problem, uh, disease infected ticks, uh, were dropped by 80%. So um, I was asked to help put together a list, you know, so we have these invasive, invasive uh, plants. I was asked to put together a list to uh, show some of the natives that could be put in if somebody is removing an invasive plant, or just a suggestion if you're starting with a blank palette of a new landscape. And so this is, uh, list is um, available online with a little more detail, and the plant list that we're going to go through today is there in your handout. And it started with uh, barberry, and looking at what alternatives uh, you could use. And barberry is nice because it has these different colors, from this burgundy to this yellow color. And what other plants could do that in the landscape that aren't invasive? And so we're looking to uh, get rid of that. And um, this is one that people are looking at. Uh, this is nine bark uh, Diablo. So it has that color. Here it is in a hedge, <coughs> but it could just be a, an individual plant in a landscape. And there's a, a dwarf variety of that as well. And they do flower for a short period of time. So that's nice as well. And then on the yellow side with the barberry, not going to use that, but there is another nine bark that has this yellow color that's been selected. It's called darts gold. And so for all the invasives, we tried to find something that was comparable in a native plant. And now we're just going to go through uh, taking a look at some of the, the native plants that you might want to consider for your own landscape or just appreciate when you see them out there. Um, Here's one that I really like, and this was taken up in Rochester's Highland Park. Mm -hmm. And this is the bottle brush buckeye. It is um, a native plant, and it forms a grove. It flowers in midsummer when not a whole lot else is in flower. And uh, it does get pretty big. Um, my wife said to 
be sure to point out that that's a corgi there, so it's a pretty small <laughs> dog there for scale. Um, but uh, yeah, you see the flowers there, and it, the name is descriptive there, like um, a bottle brush there um, held up above the foliage in midsummer. Close up of them there. And button bush, I was not familiar with this plant uh, before, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. This is a nice native, and look at those weird looking flowers. <laughs> is anybody familiar with button bush? Yeah, all right, got a thumbs up from the back of the room there, sure. Like that, yeah. Uh, How big do they get? They can get probably about 10 feet in time, but you could prune them easily to keep them <coughs> up to about uh, three or four feet. They really, in their native habitat, <coughs> They grow along wetlands. <coughs> I'll see them along streams and in those areas, but they can, we're finding that they can tolerate dry conditions very well. And <coughs> in fact, at Cornell's campus, this is uh, near the main agriculture quad there of buildings, and there's a big uh, stand of button bush there. That's how it in flower there and so not near water at all doing quite well. So button bush there. And then chokeberry. This would be a good alternative to burning bush, Euonymus elatus, that has been uh, used a lot. <coughs> this also has that nice fall color. Probably could use a new name uh, <laughs> in marketing. <laughs> chokeberry there. But uh, the birds do like it. I think if we were trying to eat the if we tried to eat the bears, we might choke on them, but uh, it's a good food for wildlife. And I have some of these in my garden now. This is uh, American holly. There are European species of hollies. This is one that is native. If you go, there's some in New York that's native, <coughs> but there's a lot in Ohio, in woodlands there. So this is the American holly, Ilex opaca. And uh, it does, there are male and female trees. The, the females uh, have the berries. And to get those berries, you do need to have a, a male in the mix there to provide the pollen. And then there are deciduous hollies as well. These are also native. And deciduous meaning that they drop their leaves. So uh, they're going to have the green leaves in the summer. And then as those berries start to appear, and we go through the fall, they'll drop their leaves, and then they look pretty good in the winter. This is outside um, my house. And this is not um, an early favorite for the birds. The birds eat this later in the season, but they will strip all of those berries eventually, and it's a good source of food for them in the winter. Adds winter interest too when we have that snow. Another holly, <coughs> and this one might need a more protected uh, location, uh, and that is the inkberry holly. It's an evergreen holly, <coughs> but it can't take uh, like too much in the way of winter drying winds. But if you have a location that's uh, near a, uh, a house, uh, this could be a good option. A good option if you want to look at something that um, is native and is an alternative to a taxa shrub or, or potentially boxwood. And here's another one that, boy, we could give this one a new name, um, and it would do better, I think. Uh, Fothergilla, so that is the genus name. Fothergilla gardeni is the genus and species. Uh, this is one of my new favorite shrubs. Um, look at that uh, picture on the left at the uh, University of Rochester campus, and there's a close-up of the flowers of this one. And it looks good so that flowers early in the spring <coughs> and then it's a good green shrub through the growing season and then the fall it gets a uh, good fall color. There it is. This is actually my landscape. There it is. That shrub is bigger now. That was a few years ago. But uh, really nice fall color. And every year <coughs> the color is a little bit different. Here it was. Uh, it had more yellows in it that year. That last picture was taken in mid-November. So Fothergilla, a good one. And there is 
a variety that's dwarfed and has uh, blue uh, foliage on it. So it has a, a waxy bloom on the leaves. Another one that uh, I like, it's a little bigger scale. Most of the varieties are going to get pretty large, uh, maybe up to eight feet or so, and that is the oak leaf hydrangea. And also another one for good fall color. This is also taken up in uh, Rochester's Highland Park. And you can see the fall color getting started, and it fades to uh, this color here. And they are big, thick, uh, leathery, leather, leathery <laughs> leaves that uh, have a lot of texture that they can bring to the garden. And then there's bayberry. Um, and this is a good deer resistant plant. If you have deer in your landscape um, and bayberry is known, it's the same plant that produces the, uh, these, oops, blank it out here, the uh, waxy fruit. And uh, to get the bayberry candles, um, early settlers would boil those uh, seeds, get a thin layer of wax at the top and with enough seed you could create uh, candles from the wax that's coming on the outside of those seeds. This also has male and female plants and it does have that, that nice scent to it. And uh, they can get rather large or you can prune them into hedge shaped um, shrubs. If you follow again. <laughs> and uh, another shrub, this one flowers too in the spring, is the red twig dogwood. <coughs> During the summer, it's not much to look at. It's really in the winter when you start to see those red twigs that um, this really shines in. This is one where it's best to prune it back just to stubble to get that new growth. That's going to have the best color. If you leave the old stems there, it's not going to be harmful. It's just not going to have this dramatic look in the winter. Here's a native stand of it uh, down in Scottsville along uh, the Genesee River. And <coughs> rhododendrons, there's plenty of rhododendrons that are native there. There's also some really good hybrids with some of the um, Asian varieties and also up in Highland Park. And some of these will uh, benefit from a more protected location in the winter, but most of them are, are not going to scorch. The leaves are going to look good through <coughs> most of the winter. They do like a more acidic soil. and if your pH is high, and you can get that tested at uh, the extension office here, if the pH is high, you might want to supplement to um, bring the pH down so that they can thrive. Related to the rhododendron are the azalea, <coughs> some good native azaleas like this flame azalea. And this one is becoming pretty common in the trade. It's fragrant shumac, and it is a low-growing uh, species that can be used in a landscape like this. And this is at Rochester's Costco. Um, they put this in in a big way uh, up to um, you know stabilize the soil there, but it looks pretty good in the fall with the fall color there. So lot of the fragrant uh, sumac rollo. <coughs> but after the leaves come off, it can be one of those plants that will attract other leaves from trees and sometimes trash <laughs> like that. So maybe just be aware of that depending on where you're planting it. That uh, might require a little maintenance to, uh, to have it look good through the winter if we don't have snow. And sweet fern. Has anybody tried sweet fern around here? This is one that um, I don't have a lot of experience with, but uh, it can do well. I think another place where we have a, a protected location for it. So it is a, a shrub. It's not related to ferns. The foliage looks a little bit like um, a fern, and that's why it has that name. It um, also, when you crush the leaves, has 
has a sweet fragrance and that's how it gets its name. I don't see this out there in the nurseries that often, but uh, yeah, I would like to give it a try. And then witch hazel. Is anybody growing witch hazel here? All right, <laughs> in the back of the room again. So it's, it's a nice one because it has bloom that shows up in the winter. And so we need a little bit of that in the winter. During the growing season, it's gonna be a, a standard shrub with some nice green foliage. But in the late fall and winter, uh, we have these yellow blooms that, that are fragrant. They smell like uh, witch hazel. So pretty good to see. And they can be also grown as a hedge. This is a demonstration garden out at um, Chicago Botanic Garden, Morton Arboretum out there actually. And uh, here it is um, next to a library. This is actually up in Rochester, Brighton Library. Yes? I, I grew one. I planted it near my house so that it would be the first thing I smell. And they're the most uh, beautiful flowers. Okay. So I looked it up and I think I have a Japanese witch hazel. Ah, uh, yes. It doesn't have the fragrance. So okay. you have to make sure it's American. There are a lot of species, there's a handful of species and a lot of different varieties, cultivated varieties. So yeah, look into those. There's one variety that doesn't drop its leaves. The, the leaves cling onto it in, um, and, and they're there for most of the winter. So that could be something to look for too. So yeah, maybe do a little research before you choose yeah. and, and get another one that's fragrant for your <laughs> yard too. And you did something that I'd recommend too. You have it near your house because if you put this well back in a backyard, where, you're, where you might not see it in the winter, it could bloom and no one would be there to see it. So uh, keeping it up front, in this case near a sidewalk, was a, a good way to, to view it. And like, you know, there are different varieties. Uh, that up there. And now we'll uh, take a look at some that aren't uh, trees or shrubs, but are perennials. This first one is butterfly weed. Asclepius tuberosa, and uh, has these orange flowers. We can see native ones uh, of this. Uh, even I'll see them driving along the thruway over along the side. They like those grassy areas. They integrate well into grass um, habitats. And uh, here you can see the flowers are very intricate. They have a lot of nectaries, so butterflies really like to uh, get their nectar from these flowers. They are a milkweed, so they have those pods, but they're not like the milkweed that can become a little bit uh, of a bully in the garden. Um, but they will have the silky seeds um, there inside those pods. Here's a bee taking advantage of some of that nectar. And I took this shot um, just off of the the throughway at the Geneva exit. Our uh, main office is at Cornell Agritech, and so I was going there. And in this was a really bad drought year, so that grass had just died because we were about four weeks into drought and hot weather. And this plant <coughs> that has swollen roots that can hold onto water, that's why it's called tuberosa as the species name, has these tubers. Uh, was doing just well where everything else had frowned out due to drought. And that wasn't planted there, that's just a, a native one that popped up. Would they have done homegrown? I don't know about, oh, we're yeah. getting a ruling? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they do? All right. Good. It also spreads out a lot, so you can get a lot of homegrown, but if you want things planted around it, you definitely want to plant. Okay, so you'll see this pop up. It doesn't spread by runners, but it can self-seed. Right. And um, I was out there, and what's this? Does anyone know what caterpillar is feeding on that? Monarch. That's the monarch uh, caterpillar, yeah. And so this is what we want to see. We have a native uh, insect feeding on a native plant. It's not going to kill this plant. It's just taking some of the leaves. It's using them as food. and. Uh, that's exactly what we want to see. And then the adult 
monarchs, probably a different generation, maybe coming from somewhere else, can also feed on the flowers as nectar. seeds and <clears throat> you know this one is good too but this one can be uh, a, a bit of a, a bully in the garden so you just plant this in an area where um, you have the space for it but uh, the monarchs can benefit from this milkweed as well uh, another one that is a good perennial is this allen root or the coral bells this one Maybe you can see a little bit of uh, fall color there. This one is blooming in the fall. And uh, it's a, a, a large uh, coral bell. The leaves, you know, maybe five or six inches across there. And it has a lot of leaf hairs on it. So it's, it's kind of interesting in that way as well. And there are all kinds of hybrid coral bells. And then moss flax. This is a, a cool uh, ground cover that is evergreen. So it'll have that green color throughout the year. And then it blooms. And people really buy this for its blooms. And you can see this in garden centers, um, especially when it's in bloom in the spring. There's a couple different colors that they offer. This is along my driveway. Uh, planted them there. And they're doing quite well, even with you know, the road salt that comes off the, the uh, car when the sludge is melting in the spring. Uh, big area. This is up at the Port of Rochester. They put in a big planting of uh, the native moss flax there, and there you can see it in bloom. And this is kind of recent. You know, we have our lilac festival um, in Japan. Uh, this is not too far from Mount Fiji. Uh, they have this, um, this moss flax festival, and they'll create different patterns every year. And so you can go online, and there you can see. Yeah. So if anyone does a small version of that, let me know. I'll come and take some pictures. <laughs> Uh, I like ferns in the landscape. Uh, this is a great one. There's so many. This one is more tolerant than some of dry conditions. So it's called the Christmas fern, probably because it's evergreen, and, and maybe the fronds look a little bit like a Christmas tree. But uh, we can see this in uh, native landscapes around here, and you could incorporate it in your garden as well. Uh, just out in the wild. There's also the ostrich fern. You're probably familiar with this. It's also pretty tolerant. When it gets dry, it'll go dormant if it's a, a drought year, but it will bounce back. And there's sensitive fern. And I think it's given this name because it's really sensitive to cold weather. Just when we get down to the mid-30s, this one will go dormant on us. But... Um, this one does like a little bit more moisture than the other two that I have on the list. It has these interesting um, fronds that are held up where it distributes its spores. <coughs> Ferns use spores rather than seeds. And so that's kind of interesting to see in the winter when the foliage is gone. And some grasses. Grasses can be important as well. They can attract songbirds when they're making their nest. Uh, they provide uh, food for caterpillars uh, and butterflies, habitat for native bees. They're often very pest resistant and they're low maintenance. You can, with their really deep roots, they can improve uh, soil conditions as well. So uh, big blue stem is a prairie grass that we would normally expect to see in the Midwestern area, but there are parts of New York where there are oak openings, where uh, we had some natural prairies in, and still do, in parts of New York. And big blue stem is one of the grasses that uh, occurs there. And here it is. This is the Morton Arboretum out in Chicago, a 
fig planting there, some uh, volunteers doing a little bit of, bit of weeding there. But from that, you can kind of get the scale of this grass. So it's a, it's a big grass, and it has some fall color there. And here is one of those oak openings. It's up in rush, uh, the, and there's some little blue stem there. And it's called little blue stem, but it gets about four feet tall. So there's a big blue stem that gets to six to eight feet tall. And it was one of the food uh, sources for buffalo. But uh, people are starting to recognize that it can be a good uh, plant for our garden as well. Some more examples. Big blue stem there. There it is in the winter. And this is one that we're really starting to see a lot more of recently. It's getting out there in the trade, and it is called prairie drop seed. And for an area maybe that's steep, this could be a good uh, plant to include in there where you don't want to run the mower that often um, because it only gets up to be you know, about a foot tall before it kind of flops over on itself. It does have a little fall color. Here it is at Swarthmore uh, College in Pennsylvania. They put in a big planting of it, another view of that there. So they don't have to mow that, but it looks green. Uh, it's not going to take foot traffic, so it's not for everywhere, but um, something to consider. They have small plantings of it at Cornell's Botanic Garden. And if you're there at the right time, this is one of those grasses that flowers. It's flowering here close up of a flower over on the right, but uh, the flowers are fragrant, which is really unusual for a grass. They, they kind of smell like popcorn or, or something else that's <laughs> sweet, but you can pick that up. They're attracting pollinators, actually. Most of the grass grasses are just wind pollinated. This is one that uh, attracts some pollinators to it, so an interesting grass to have there. And then uh, eastern redbud, we're kind of at the northern limit of red bud when you travel south through Pennsylvania you can see a lot of it Maryland and Delaware but um, it does quite well here and it has those heart shaped leaves and the purple flowers in the spring the, they're definitely it's called red bud the buds can look a little bit red before they open up but the flowers are purple I think there's a variety that has uh, white flowers and there's also a variety of the plant that has uh, purple leaves as well Service berry is definitely native here. It's kind of like the um, uh, red bud in that uh, we're kind of at the northern limits of it. But this one is a nice one that has fruit. When I see it out there in the summer, it's also called June berry. I'll have some of these. And up in Canandaigua, there was a, an outfit that was looking at starting to cultivate the service berry as a, a fruit that we would consume has that potential and very early uh, flowering in the spring, one of the first to bloom like that before our, fruit tr our regular fruit trees bloom. And I took these pictures yesterday. This is from uh, my yard, so another early blooming plant, and that is the uh, spice bush. And these are one of those plants that you can sometimes find from the soil and water conservation districts in your county sold as seedlings. That's where I got uh, the plants there in my yard. And so they're just, you know, a bundle for maybe 10 or $12. <coughs> and it's a really nice early spring bloomer. And it looks great the rest of the year. Also, there is the spice bush butterfly that um, the caterpillars will feed exclusively on this plant. And it has those spots there. So those aren't eyes, but they are to scare predators that might think they're a bigger uh, insect than they are. But uh, there's the spice bush butterfly. And it has a uh, nice fall color as well. And um, yeah, so going on to fall color, I'll, I'll put in a little plug here. This was nice fall color last year. At the other end of Puka Lake, uh, 
Uh, this is at Hammond's Port, and uh, I'm a volunteer at the Finger Lakes Boat Museum. And if you want to take a ride, you can <laughs> take a look at their website. And we have a, a, a boat there that's back on the water, 1920s boat that was uh, restored by volunteers there. So, uh, yeah, maybe I'll see you there in the <laughs> summer. But I do have to talk a, a little bit about invasive plants. Do I have some time? Or invasive insects? How much time? You got time. Okay, Take good. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is <coughs> kind of what, what I've been working on over the last few years. Does everybody know about this? Yeah. So this is then mostly a reminder to just keep an eye out for this because it is not known to be in Yates County yet, but it's showing up in more and more locations. It is? How big is it? Like, give me how big is it? It is an inch. The adults are just about an inch, they can vary slightly, but uh, they're about an, an inch. So, and they have spots on them and orange underwings. <coughs> so they're pretty distinctive, mm -hmm. but I'll show you that they, they can be somewhat camouflaged as well. Mm -hmm. So it's an invasive plant hopper. It kind of looks like a moth um, and it has fly in its name, but it is a plant hopper. And that's important because of the way it feeds. It feeds on the plant's pipework, the xylem and phloem that gets in there and is um, a sap feeder. Over 100 different species, you know, when I was talking about this uh, five years ago, we had like 30 species we knew. It, it's probably double that when we'll be done with the, the plant species that it can feed on, but it has its favorites. What's its favorite plant that it, it harms, do you know? Grapes. Grapes. Yeah. It is deep and it's county. It's <coughs> Cornell did a, a study of them in vineyards on the eastern side of Cooper Lake. Okay. Uh, and they went up and down and they found those in almost every vineyard mm. on the eastern side of Cooper Lake. Uh, maybe it was another insect. <laughs> I'm watching this one pretty closely. The, it's not there now. I mean, there, there have been some reports of it, um, and they found some dead ones, but we don't have an active colony here yet in Yates County. Yes? Um, I'm wondering if the mapping that was referred to just now is actually about Tree of Heaven, which oh, is yes. uh, their favorite yes. thing. Thanks. Host. Yes. Uh, my apologies, but... No, um, this fits in per perfectly with the next slide here, because this is probably what you're referring to, its favorite host, and it can do really well when it has access to this plant. We've all seen this, but we might not recognize that we know what it is because it's not something we'd find in a nursery or a garden center. The tree of heaven, it self seeds, and it is a weedy plant in itself, but when spotted lanternfly has access to this, it can do really well, and it's attracted to it in any new area where we will find spotted lanternfly is on Alanthus first. And it will move around through the growing season, but it's going to feed for a while on one of these Tree of Heaven plants. Is the Tree of Heaven native? It is not native. It is native to where this insect was native to in Asia. So they, uh, you know, developed together. And we happen to have this invasive plant before <coughs> <coughs> spotted lanternfly was introduced. Will it kill the, will it kill the tree of heaven? Will it, it, you know, hosts or um, insects normally don't kill their host plant, their favorite one. This one will. So in parts of Pennsylvania, there are dead standing tree of heaven uh, plants. And how did it get that name? Uh, there's speculation it's just because it grows so fast that it reaches the heavens very quickly. Sounds like you know about the tree of heaven. Terrible. Yeah, it yeah, it is. And the seed heads here. Whoops, I'm trying to point here. The seed heads distribute those seeds. There are also male and female uh, trees. And at this time of year, before the leaves are out, you can still see those uh, seed heads around. How would you protect black walnuts? Yeah, they do also like to feed on black walnuts, but they're not going to kill a black walnut um, plant. Uh, the most shade trees are going to be fine. It is the Atlantis and grapes that we're primarily concerned about. The tree of heaven does have one saving grace. What's that? Cracksmen like it. It has a nice frame. Oh, okay. 
well, there maybe we should cut them down and give them to the woodworkers. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do, I have to say, if you do have one in your yard and you cut it down, it will sprout from the roots. So this is one case where we'd recommend um, after it's cut uh, using a, an herbicide on that uh, stump so that's absorbed into the roots and kills it. Otherwise, you know, you'll need to mow whatever comes up from the base. Yeah, and here's our current distribution map. So it's up in Syracuse. Uh, it's in Ithaca in a really small area. The most recent one was in Buffalo. And uh, the Syracuse, Buffalo, and um, the other one uh, down in Free Lakes were all associated with rail lines. The ones in Ohio also. Uh, so it may be laying its eggs on rail cars, and then if they're in a new location in the spring, um, they uh, hatch there at those new locations. So yeah, we're maintaining the national map for this. And uh, here it is, the new location in Buffalo. But it's really important for us in New York State because of our grape and, and wine industry that are here, including, you know, a majority of the juice grapes uh, for the country are grown here along Lake Erie and uh, in New York and in that part of Pennsylvania. So the Concord grape growing region has more grapes, uh, more acreage of grapes than the rest of the state uh, because they're mechanically harvested. But very important. Uh, this is a dead vineyard that was uh, killed in Pennsylvania all due to spotted butterfly feeding weakens the, the plants so they're not able to uh, survive the winter. And our first one uh, was this fall in a vineyard in New York State, and that was in Orange County. They were looking really closely on Long Island at some of the new vineyards there and um, in the Hudson Valley where it's moving up uh, from mm -hmm. Pennsylvania and down one. So the, the growers are on alert there. Uh, over the last five years, no vineyards have been lost uh, because we know what to do. It does require scouting at the end of the season and treating. But, and we thought the populations were going to drop down. A colleague in Pennsylvania sent me this. Can you see all of those uh, insects there? That's the one vine. So, yeah, that's just it's taking so much energy from the vine it itself that it can, yeah, severely impact them. So. And, so in the city, this is an urban farm on Staten Island, and they had uh, the nymphs, which look very different than the adults, both on cucumber and okra. <coughs> this is their and little vacuum sucked them up there. But uh, right now, whoops, no, I keep doing this. But if there is anything out there, it's still an egg mess. It'll be mid-May, and the uh, nymphs will hatch out. They'll go through a few instars, shedding their skin, becoming larger. Then in July, they'll develop this red color. And from there, a slit will develop on the back side of this insect, which is maybe about a half to three quarters of an inch long. And then the adult will emerge from that fourth instar. And they can be around until um, the first hard freeze, which can be as late as December. They lay their eggs starting right around September 20th. It's associated uh, some with day length. Mm -hmm. And this is what the egg masses look like. Like I said, this is what would be around right now. But they're relatively camouflaged. We used to say they would lay their eggs on any hard material, but now we know that they can lay their eggs on anything. Here's a camp chair. Mm -hmm. If you notice on the map, there was a, a location in Indiana that had a spotted lanternfly, and there's no spotted lanternfly around it. A farm relocated from uh, Pennsylvania in an infested area to Indiana, and probably unknowingly on some of their equipment were the egg masses, and so there's a new population there. That's what we want to uh, try to prevent, creating awareness. It was in Pennsylvania to catch an egg hatch one day there. They move slowly at first, and this was on a post, so the female laid eggs there, and they start to distribute that fourth instar, and so yeah, they are pretty big, about an inch, but here, you know, when you're close up, 
you're not going to confuse this with any other insect. However, uh, can you see them there? I was in Harrisburg area, and I took this picture. But uh, if you look closely, they're there. So they can be surprisingly camouflaged. This is how they feed. They use this structure to go right through the bark, tap into that uh, pipe work, the xylem and phloem, getting the sap out. And they excrete out of this end here honeydew, which is their waste product. But it has sugars in it, and so you mold can grow on that. And this is just um, a video. Let's see. see if you ever see a spotted lanternfly is um, the honeydew coming out from them and if you're under a tree that has a lot of them it can feel like uh, a little bit of drizzle it's, it's that much and then this fungus uh, sooty mold grows on top of it it can be this bad in a big nuisance in a backyard the uh, sooty mold was removed from this step so you can see and then bees can be attracted to it. But it's not every tree that's going to look like that. Uh, but it was in New York City this year, so it grabbed a lot of attention. They were calling us up. My colleagues and I handled many of these um, calls from the media, including this one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a junior associate with our program was actually quoted in there, and he was the voice of reason from what the New York Post did with this <laughs> story. Uh, and yeah, there's been a lot of interest, even in Philadelphia when it hit there, <laughs> people were calling on one. Um, little spots, is that honeydew over the summer, and then boom, uh, this was in October. And my sister-in-law posted this picture on the right, I believe, on Facebook and got this kind of response in two days. <laughs> people feel very strongly about this. I know some of these people, but they just kind of <laughs> went off here. And they gave advice that we are not recommending a Cornell extension, <laughs> including <laughs> um, blow torches and uh, flares and all kinds of things. Well, what are you recommending? <laughs> yeah. So there are traps that you can use. Um, that can get a lot of them if you have a tree like this. Uh, there, there's one called a circle trap. There are uh, instructions on making that. It's just using screening uh, online. You can see that um, for grape growers, they have a list of insecticides that they can use. They're looking at other ways, including removing the Atlantis, the tree of heaven, which might help as well. But we like to remind people that they don't bite don't sting and they can't become a structural pest. They can't survive in the house. Uh, we did studies with them and off of a host plant they can only live for two days. They mm -hmm. constantly have to feed or they'll mm -hmm. desiccate. And some hope for the future is uh, there are these fungi that are naturally feeding on them. Kind of like gypsy moth or spongy moth now that can be a big problem uh, temporarily it will, the populations will collapse. We're hoping that that could happen at, at some point in the future or that these could be developed into a treatment that might be available. Uh, so some natural. Who's, who's Eric? Eric Clifton is the um, graduate student who identified some of these uh, insects. So he was a Cornell graduate student. He, he's now working for a company that helps um, market these kinds of, they develop them and they put them out to the market. Yeah, so. Oh, and there are uh, predators that feed on them as well. And the chickens in the backyard, some birds will feed on them. So I think I'll, I'll just stop right there. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take those.